Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. We're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 3. If you would turn in your word in the Bible and I will have it on the screen for you as well. <clears throat> 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to talk about life according to scripture. We've been in a series called Holding On to Truth. And we've been discussing the reliability of the Bible as the source for framing our worldview. And that we can, with confidence, have the Bible to be our framework, our lens on how to see life, how to interpret the times. Okay, the Bible is the truth that guides me in every area of my life and your life. And I have shared for the past three to four weeks the evidence that we have that the Bible is trustworthy and reliable and it is from God. Would you agree? I think you've been here. For those of you who are guests, just so you know, we've been doing that. The reason why I set up evidence for uh, the Bible being reliable in history uh, outside of the Bible, what historians say, what others say, is because we believe it to be the truth to actually help us know how to live life, what to believe in, and also how to guide other people who do not yet believe. And I'm going to say something, uh, and just so you know, this message is, it, it is for us Christians more than anything. Um, but I'm going to say something up front here in the beginning too, and I don't mean this with any kind of arrogance or anything. I just mean this because I believe God is the creator of every person. Okay. He's creator of all things. I believe that the, the Bible is for all people. Okay. And not everyone understands that yet. And not everyone will agree with that either. But I believe the word of God has, is meant to be lived by every person because God created all mankind. Everyone. And so everyone should live according to the word, but not everyone will because they disagree with that. And that's okay. Because we're not going to force God on people. And God will draw them. All right? But as Christians, we need to get on the same page. Do you see my face in that camera? Look at my face. We, you can zoom in if you want. No, sure. We need to get on the same page, my friends. It's one thing to be not a Christian and be a non-Christian, unchristian person, to be not a believer of God, you know, and go, yeah, I, I, I don't agree with it. It's another to be a Christian who believes in the Bible as God's word and go, yeah, I don't really believe all of it is true. Right there, you can't establish a strong foundation for a biblical worldview if you don't believe God has inspired all scripture. And so that was how I started the reliability. If you may not remember, but I talked about what is the Bible. And I started with all scripture is God breathed. Okay. All of it is from God. Okay. And I focused on the authority of God's word. And so let me read the scripture again and give you a little context. And then let me get into uh, the second portion of that scripture and how we're supposed to apply it to our lives because life according to scripture is the message and the point today. So let's go to 2 Timothy 3. I'm going to read the NLT version, 14 through 17. And uh, I'm sorry, yeah, 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17. And then I'm going to read the verses 16, 17 in the English standard version. So you might have different versions and that's okay. Verse 14, and this is Paul talking to his apprentice, his understudy, Timothy. And he says this, but you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. Now, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, we learn that his grandmother and mother also taught him scripture. Thank you, grandmothers, mothers, fathers, grandfathers. Thank you so much for pouring into us over the years. Thank you for clapping so I can get a little water too. Appreciate that. But we also know that Paul taught him scriptures, but since his childhood, Timothy was being discipled. And Paul is saying, you know those people, because he's, he's addressing false, false teachers in the church, and Timothy has to combat them too, because he's a pastor in Ephesus. And he's like, don't, he's even telling a pastor, don't sway from the truth. 
a pastor. And we're living in a world where pastors are abandoning the truth, aren't we? So he's saying, don't sway from it. You know those who taught you. And he's talking about himself as well. And he says something powerful, okay, in the rest of that scripture, that verse. And they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. It is without, without the scriptures, we wouldn't know salvation. We wouldn't have, we wouldn't know how to receive salvation. And Paul's saying it is because of the scriptures, you have the wisdom to know how to trust in Jesus Christ. Without Jesus, we wouldn't have salvation to trust in Jesus. So then he goes into what we already addressed. Verse 16, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Now the ESV version says this, and it's on the screen. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable. So instead of using the word useful, it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, which means to rebuke or uh, convict, for correction, which is to fix the path, to straighten the path on the right path and for, and for training in righteousness, to discipline us to live a life of righteous and holy living. That the man of God or all people, okay? Uh, this is actually a, a gender neutral Greek word there, but in the ESV they use man of God. It just means mankind, okay? May be complete, equipped for every good work. Okay, that sounds like the Bible is really valuable and important, doesn't it? Useful and profitable for teaching us, first of all, number one, to teach us, uh, well, let me, let me hold off on that. Let me, let me say, share something that God put on my heart this week first. I'm jumping ahead. I want to just take a moment to talk about all scriptures inspired by God or breathed out by God. Check out this, this what I've come to conclude if I believe the word of God is the word of God, if the Bible is the word of God, it would be internally consistent. In other words, no contradictions. And this will be on the screen for you. And it is. It's internally consistent. The Bible would be externally verified. And it is. So history, uh, archaeological digs, all verify the scripture. Okay? Okay. The Bible would be full of the most profound wisdom, and the Bible is full of profound wisdom. Everyone quotes the Bible, even people who aren't believers quote the wisdom of the Bible. The Bible would hold the loftiest or most lofty ethics, and it does. Everyone uses love your neighbor as yourself. Everyone uses the golden rule, do unto others as he would have them do unto you. The world uses that all the time. The Bible would transform lives, and it has, a, and it continues to, doesn't it? Amen? It's changed your life. The Bible would be the most influential book in the world, and it is still today, selling the most copies of all books in history since its printing, since the beginning and conception of its printing. It has been the most influential book. You know why? Because it is the Word of God. If, if, if God wrote it, if God's the author of it, it would have to boast all those things, and it does. And so we believe that. And just so you know, we believe that if it's the authoritative word of God, that we come under the word of God, not we over the word of God. In other words, the word of God judges us. We don't judge the Bible. It teaches us how to live. We don't tell God how we should live. And then I want to I want to throw something out there to you. I don't I don't have so much time, but let me let me put this out there. Um, we believe that if we believe, okay, the Bible is God's word and message of truth to us. If we believe that, if we if we love God, and we want to like if if we believe that, wouldn't we want to know what God thinks and what God says? right? The question is, is does our habit of reading the Bible match that belief? Think about that for a second. If we really believe that the creator of the universe is the author of this book and he's omniscient and all-knowing, 
wouldn't we run to this word all the time? Let that sink in for a second because it hit me hard this week. It, it was a sobering, humble thought. Do I run to the word of God as much as I should? Because we're talking about God trying to talk to me. That's the word of God. Are you hearing me on that? And, and I feel like if we really do believe that this is from God and that we have the ability to hear from God, we would run to his word as much as we can whenever we need it. And it's not that you have to like be glued to it, right? But we would go to seek God's will and message for us over and over again, especially in a world that's sending a different message to us every day. We would want this. Now, I know that sounds maybe elementary, to, but I think we take for granted that this is God speaking to us. And so it should change how often we're in it. And statistically, it says that believers are not in their word very often. And I'm laying it on heavy today because we're talking about, first of all, us. If we're going to have a biblical worldview, the Bible has to impact us first before we try to impose that on other people. Am I right or am I wrong? Before we put that on other people, yeah. It needs to be put on us. And so I believe that this is the word of God and that's what makes me run to it. It's what makes me read it today and tomorrow so I can hear what God, my creator, wants me to hear. Okay, good, I got that off my chest. But here's the rest of the verse, because it's not just about knowledge, although we need the knowledge for the first part, because it says, and it is useful or profitable for teaching or doctrine, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So we need knowledge, okay, but God's knowledge applied is visibly transformational in our lives. In other words, God's knowledge should change how we live and how we speak and everything else. And we know that. So profitable and useful for teaching and doctrine. It is because of the Bible that we know what to believe in in this world. It's because of the Bible that we know what the Trinity is, what sin is, what mankind is supposed to be, what marriage is supposed to be like, what family is supposed to be like, what salvation and what other future events. It is because of these things, because of the Bible, that we can formulate doctrines that the church stands on and believes in until Jesus comes back. It's because of the Bible. And Paul is telling Timothy to hold on to the teaching and doctrine of scripture because it's from God. It's not from man. All right. Secondly, he says that it's, it's profitable for rebuke. Well, wait a second, Ryan, that doesn't sound very, you know, that doesn't sound very nice getting corrected or getting, getting rebuked and reproofed, you know, yes, it is. God, God's word, it, it, it calls us out. It will say, you're wrong. Can everyone say, I am wrong. Let's practice that. <laughs> I am wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> right? It seems like that's a, a, a virtue that's lacking in our society. The Bible is God's word. We come under it, not above it. And so it's going to say some things that are going to hurt. Because God loves you. God loves me. God loves us. He doesn't want us to go down the wrong path. But what I love is he doesn't just say this is wrong. Now he, this is what Paul says. The Bible is profitable, useful for correction. And the meaning here is like a broken bone being reset and realigned so it can heal. And so God doesn't just break you because of your sin. You know, I don't know if you felt that today, like a brokenness for your sin, but I'm praying that we feel that so that we won't return to it and then we'll be healed by his mercy. And so he heals us by correcting us. And let me, let me give you a, a scripture verse to help with that as an example, because it's profitable and useful for correction. So Ephesians 4, 28 says, let the thief no longer steal. Okay, that's a rebuke. Let the thief no longer steal. Just giving you an everyday example, okay? But there, here's the part where it's correction. 
but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands. So that, you ready for this? So not just don't steal, but I want you to work, okay? In the church, Paul said, I want you to not steal. We want you to work, okay? And not only work, but then he goes on to say this, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. So now that person is able to be a sharing, giving, generous person instead of a thief. So it doesn't just tell the thief you're wrong. The Bible tells you where you should be in life. Now, I know we all get that. But when we read the word, we have to let that take place in our reading, in our digesting of it. So lastly, Paul says the scriptures are profitable and useful in the way of righteous and holy living. Now, just so you know, it is the grace of God through salvation that you can even be holy. Jesus' holiness is applied to you. His righteousness is applied to you by faith. And therefore, in God's eyes, you are righteous. It's not your works that make you righteous. That is the gospel. I want us to make sure we hold on to that. It is because of Jesus that you are righteous. All right, it is because of the Holy Spirit that you can even live holy, hence Holy Spirit living in us. Now, the second part is this. God in his grace, he's so good. He gives us the Bible to spell and trace out what he means by living a holy life. And he also gave us Jesus to show us what a holy life looks like. So the Bible is useful and confirming what Jesus has done inside of you. So that's why you don't just get saved, you now read the Holy Bible to confirm what God has done in you, to give you even more faith and more strength to live the life God has called you to live. That is why the Bible is profitable and useful. And can I get an amen for that? Because man, that is awesome. And then he's not done. The Bible doesn't just just like correct and, and fix things and teach you how to live. The Bible helps complete you so you can do every good work God has ordained for you. That's verse 17. It says, so that the servant of God or the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The ESV version again said the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now, let me make sure you understand something. And I'll use David Guzik's uh, Enduring Word Commentary to explain this because complete doesn't mean that the only completion we have is the word of God. Okay. The Bible doesn't do all the completion. Okay. Let me, let me share what he says. I I agree with him hundred percent. Complete doesn't mean that the whole Christian life is about reading the Bible. Okay. It's not, you don't, your Christian life isn't just reading the Bible, but it's definitely up there or that the only important thing in ministry is good Bible teaching. No complete means the Bible leads me into everything I need So I don't ignore prayer or worship or evangelism or good works to a needy world because the Bible itself tells me to do such things. If I would be both a hearer and doer of the word, I will be complete. I agree so much. Because here's the other thing too. The Bible is only as good as we let it affect our lives and do what it says to do. It's useful for transforming our lives. And God is not only redeeming you and saving you to worship him in a church service. He's redeeming and working on you to worship him outside of church services and to serve him and use the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives you to minister to people in the world and to minister to the church. Now, you are... You are being restored by God to do good works. You may not feel like that, but that's the truth. That's encouraging. But it's going to take the Bible to show you how to be complete and equipped for every good work. So we need to read the Bible. So, okay, we we read these verses and it challenges us to approach approach Scripture. And I'm just going to give you three ways to close the rest of this message out. All right, to apply it to our lives, I'm just going to give you three ways that this scripture challenges me and challenges us as a church uh, to approach scripture. Number one, we have to submit to the authority and wisdom of God and his word. 
I know, I know that's not a popular word in our society today, to submit to authority. But do we believe God is God? And do we believe he's much wiser than we are and all-knowing? It's probably a good idea to submit to his wisdom and knowledge than our own. Uh, we need God's divine revelation. We need God's divine vision and, and instruction and guidance. We're lost without God, church. We're lost. Let me, let me read to you what Proverbs 26, 12 says. Do you see a person wise in their own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for them. Mm. Like when people think they're wise and they know which way to go. I know what to do. I got this all figured out. I'm like this close to God. Like I'm just, just below him. Like right, He's here. I'm right there. I know I'm wise in my own eyes. No, you know what that is? That's pride. And the Bible says there's more hope for a fool, which Proverbs rebukes fools a lot. There's more hope for fools than someone who believes they got it all figured out. That's what he's trying to say here in this proverb. And then in Proverbs 14, 12, it says there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. There is a way that appears to be right in our eyes, in our own understanding. But in the end, it actually leads us to death. So we thought we were right and we weren't. Why am I bringing these verses up? Because when we don't submit to God's authority and we don't submit to his word, we start going down the wrong path. When we think we know it all, when we think we know the right way, we may want to double check that God's word says that's the right way. That's why I'm bringing that up. Outside the Bible, we only have our hearts and our judgment calls. And I've seen even my own heart and I've even you know, dealt with my own judgments. How about you? Have you seen what your heart wants to do sometimes or what your mind thinks or the judgment calls you made on things? Don't you think you might not want to trust your heart? Doesn't the world tell you, follow your heart, honey. Follow your heart. Uh, I don't want wicked hearts to be followed. Uh, I, if, your, if your heart is wicked, please don't follow your heart. Because it's, it's probably going to hurt me. It's probably going to hurt others. No, Jeremiah says that the heart is desperately wicked. It's deceitfully wicked. Our hearts can, without God's help, our hearts are deceiving us all the time. Like we know the right way. Why do we need to submit to scripture? Because we're not God and our hearts need help. And I'm saying, I'm preaching to myself, church. We need help, all of us. All right. Look at, look at what Proverbs 3, 5 through 7 recommends. Let's look at what the Bible says, not, not that meme you saw online or that post that says, follow your heart. Let's see what the Bible actually posts. Proverbs 3, 5 through 7, trust in the Lord with all your heart. In other words, submit your heart to God. Okay, give your heart's intentions to God. And lean not on your own understanding, which in the Bible, the mind and the heart are together. So don't lean on your own heart or mind. In all your ways, instead, submit to him and he will make your path straight. He will actually lead you down a path of life, not death. And then, oh my goodness, there it is. Verse seven, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord instead and shun evil. Well, there you have it. We need God's help. We need God's word so that we go down the right path, so that we do have a biblical worldview in a world that could care less what God thinks. And we want to take bites from them and advice from the world, and it, it, it mocks God and his wisdom. Instead, we submit to the word of God. Amen? Amen? Because the world doesn't know where it's going either. And neither do we, if we're honest. We need God.
So secondly, if that wasn't heavy enough, how about number two? <laughs> we approach the scriptures with humility. And you, you heard that already. You know, if I'm going to let it rebuke and correct me, I got to be humble. Look what Isaiah 26, 10 says. And I'm encouraging you today to not be like the wicked. Okay, don't be like the wicked. Don't just trust your heart. Trust God with all your heart. Okay, lean on him. It says this, but when grace is shown to the wicked, they do not learn righteousness. In other words, they don't change. Even in, the, in a land of uprightness, even in a land where everyone's doing right, they go on doing evil and do not regard the majesty of the Lord. Ouch. In other words, God will show us grace at times, God shows people grace and we still don't let it change us. We don't let it alter our lives and correct our paths in the right way. Even if we're around other believers who are letting God do that, we could be in danger. If we're wicked, we can be in danger of still ignoring the uprightness of everyone else's life around us and we still choose our own path that is not of God's. And here's what we tend to do, just so you know. We tend to surround other people around us that will agree with our wicked path. You know I'm not lying, right? We tend to take people's other, other people who would agree with us on that nuance or whatever it may be, we tend to take their opinions and surround ourselves with it in an echo chamber so that therefore we will feel at peace that what we've done is right. But let me repeat the scripture in Proverbs 14, 12. We think we know. In our own eyes, we think we're wise, but we're going down the path of destruction. We need to be humble before God and his word and let it correct us. Uh, we need to set aside our presuppositions when we open the Bible. What do I mean by that? We don't read the Bible to find what we want it to say and to affirm what we want to live. No, we open our Bibles and let it say what it says and discover what it truly means. And if it gets uh, if it goes in, in complete contrast to how we want to think or live, we're even willing to do that as well. We're willing to let it be what it says, even if it's in complete contrast of how we want to live or how we want to think. And lastly, to add what we want it to say or to remove things we don't like that it says is to pollute and distort God's truth and message for us. And there is severe punishment, especially for teachers and preachers, but even for anyone else, if we try to take away or add to the scriptures, it says there's severe punishment for those who do that. Why am I doing this? Why am I getting so heavy on this? Um, again, we can't ask the world to follow God if we look just like it. We're gonna confuse them. So lastly, we have to approach the scriptures with the intent to live them out. This is, this is simple, but it's, it's true. I open up my Bible and I read it and I was, that was a cool story, that was good. That's about it. I wanna encourage you to open your Bible to submit to whatever God says, to be humble about what it says, to correct or to, to train you, to teach you how to live. And then I want you to actually live it out. And it's not me, that's God. James 1, don't just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. It is in the doing that we see the usefulness of scripture come to life. Amen. So Christians, we're, you know, we're in this series about holding on to truth 
And there's going to be some heavy stuff I'm bringing up. And I'm, I'm going to wait on some things I want to say um, for an entire message. But I just need you to know that we need to be in agreement with God's word together. It's not going to be easy. It's never been easy to line up with God and his word. It's never, it never has. Look at Jesus. He was crucified for it. And he did amazing things. He was perfect. It's going to be hard. We're going to lose people in our lives. There's going to be people that disagree with us completely. They're going to argue with us. They're going to slander you. They're going to call you names and everything. All that's going to happen. My biggest concern, though, is, is that we, the church, are in unity on the same page together. Because, look, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy to live in the guidelines and the, and, and the biblical worldview that God has for us. It's not easy, but it's profitable. It's useful. It's a blessing. It's a blessing to live in the favor and will of God. It's the safest place to be. Even when people disagree with you, it's the safest place to be in the will of God. Amen. Church, uh, this world is really wearing down on Christians and we're giving in. We're giving in way too much to the pressure of our loved ones or our friends or the world to not appear a certain way. So we're, we're trying not to offend the world, but meanwhile, we're offending God. Can we stand together? I want to encourage you, if you need to... If you need to repent of that, you know, you've been... You've been compromising so you don't offend someone. You know, you know that's wrong, but you're like, oh, yeah, it's okay. If that's been you, it's okay to apologize before God and, and start telling the truth. Start living the truth. That's what God wants. And then we as a church, I'm going to go back to that, to the beginning. If we believe this, this word is the word of God, church, we need to know it. And we need to let it do what it does. It's profitable for so many things. There's profit in the word of God and living it out. We need to let it change us. Trust it. Let it work in us. Let me, let me wrap up that last point about living the word of God. The word of God works when we work the word. Remember that. The word of God works when we work the word. It does. And I'm just, I'm, I'm asking you to pray for me, to pray for one another, because there's going to be topics I'm bringing up in this series the devil does not like. And there's going to be things that maybe you even disagree with me on. All I'm asking you is, if you're going to disagree, make sure you check the word of God first. Because if God says it first, it's not me saying it. <laughs> Praise God. Hey, if you've been, if you need to walk to Christ today, his arms are wide open today for salvation. I have prayer team members who are going to come up right now. Why don't you come up, prayer team, any staff are in the room. We're going to pray for people. If you, need, if you need prayer for strength, you've been in a battle. You've been in a battle with family members or friends and on truth and the word. We want to pray for you right now. And we're going to close, but we're going to let people linger and hang out and let God work. We do have a water baptism to do here in a moment. Praise God. We have around a dozen people getting water baptized. So we're thankful for that. Praise God. Praise God. God is working. His word is working in lives. He's saving people. And so we're ready, we're ready to pray for you, but I just want to encourage you if, you, if you need to come back to Jesus or come to him for the first time, let these people pray with you. And if you have anything you need prayer for, maybe it's someone else, let them pray for you. I want to leave you with a benediction. I left it. Uh, God put this on my heart this week, and I want to leave you with some, some peaceful thoughts as well. Not to take away from the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Don't get me wrong. Let God convict you. Let God work through this word. All right? But we need God's help, right? 
Listen to this, Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. This is a, this is a prayer for the church. Now may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood. May he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. And the church says, amen. amen. God, I thank you for this church. God, I pray that you'd bring us in unity and agreement with your word and then with each other. It is your word, your son Jesus, that brings us in agreement and in unity. Lord, I pray that we would all stand on your word and not our human philosophy. Help us to build our lives on a biblical stand, standard and foundation. God, I thank you, Lord, that you're gonna help us. You're gonna strengthen us in the days ahead where the world will come against your church. But Lord, we will be victorious and we want the world to be changed and join us, to join you, the great shepherd, leading us into salvation and eternity. Lord, help us to live consistent with your word so we don't confuse the world, but instead we show them the way to eternal life. We love you, God, and we thank you for all that you're doing and going to do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, church.